every vector database seems to be doing exactly the same thing. So how is ChromaDB different? They all uh, market themselves as the same or similar, um, but the reality can be very different under the hood. Developers shouldn't have to know about all the optimizations that go on under the hood. You, know, you don't want your retrieval system to be difficult. You categorically mentioned that you want to keep Chroma open source and free forever. How does that work? You are going live with a hosted Chroma database sometime soon. As a company, is you should give away the engine and then monetize the car around it. You know, you can't just uh, cut all the cylinders in half and call it an engine. No, the engine has to be a truly open source thing. Are you going to follow the approach of MongoDB? Uh, do you want to make that very transparent and have independent of any hyperscaler? I mean, we're going to have to build on top of the hyperscalers. Uh, there's, you know, <laughs> building our own data centers from the ground up is probably not advisable at this time. It's going to be a pretty complex orchestration that uh, we're going to see. Jeff Huber, CEO of ChromaDB. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Encounter, where we bring you face-to-face -face with the most inspiring leaders of our time. Today, I am excited to host Jeff Huber, CEO of ChromaDB. Jeff, welcome to my show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So with uh, vector databases becoming the front and center of Gen AI, I am uh, really looking forward to the discussion. So uh, for the folks uh, who are not familiar with vector databases, if you are not, you are going to get familiar very soon because they are going to be the most important uh, aspect of dealing with Gen AI. So, so Jeff, I want to ask you a question very upfront. So, every vector database uh, seems to be doing exactly the same thing, you know, index, uh, semantic search, and retrieval. So, how is Chroma DB different? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, maybe I'd you know, kind of push back on the assertion that they're all the same to start. Um, <laughs> I think they all uh, market themselves as the same or similar, um, but the reality can be very different under the hood. Um, so a bunch of different ways to kind of approach this question. I think like fundamentally, you know, what we think about at Chroma is like, what is the developer experience of using this system? Um, and how can we give developers the uh, best retrieval experience with the kind of least knowledge of vectors and approximate nearest neighbor index types and calibration as possible. Um, you know, we often think about how uh, early in the database, relational database phase, um, you know, developers shouldn't have to know about all the optimizations that go on under the hood. You know, it comes to the query planning level, they should be able to interface, um, you know, with it at a SQL level. And today, I think that most of the solutions that exist are extremely complicated are extremely difficult to use, require the developer to have all kinds of knowledge about how to tune the system to even get good behavior um, out of the system. And you, know, you don't want your retrieval system to be difficult. Um, building applications with AI is hard enough that you, know, you really just want your retrieval system to work and work out of the gate. Um, and that's what our goal is at Chroma. So if you look at, I think, you know, our landing page, our docs, our API, everything's designed to be as approachable and you know, intuitive as possible. Um, and we're working on things now um, that I think are going to even improve this. So one of the things that's just sort of an example that a lot of people don't know about Chroma is actually our index type already has this very like lightweight uh, smartness to it. Um, so for example, inside of Chroma, if you have under a thousand documents in a collection, it actually just brute forces it. Um, it doesn't even use an approximate nearest neighbor um, search. It only switches over to the approximate nearest neighbor after you cross a thousand things. And that's actually also fully tunable as a developer, you can change that threshold. Um, so that's like one teeny tiny example. But again, I think that when it comes to great developer experience, um, being purpose-built is a huge advantage. Um, and ultimately having taste and passion for the thing that you're making uh, really shows. Got it, got it. Yeah, I, I have been uh, a developer using ChromaDB for a while and I can, I can vouch for that. It's simple. What I love is the pip install, and uh, you can even do that from a collab notebook. You don't need to have uh, access to the host. I think that's a very uh, easy way to get started. I, I, I agree with you. So, uh, so Jeff, it's interesting that you know when I when I read the about us page on your website, uh, you categorically mentioned that you want to keep Chroma open source and free forever. Mm. Uh, at the same time. Uh, 
you are going live with a hosted Chroma database sometime soon. So how does that work? Yeah, I think the, you know, the history of data products uh, being open source and commercializing in a way that supports the community in a way the community is frankly cool with uh, is pretty long, right? So uh, people were actually not really building the hosted version of Chroma um, because we want to ramp revenue or because our investors are pressuring us to do this. Um, in fact, many of our investors have asked the opposite question. Hey, should we just focus on open source for longer? before turning on any, you know, kind of monetization or hosting. Um, we're doing it because we think that it's the right thing to do to serve developers even better. In particular, the JavaScript and TypeScript communities uh, really want to have this turnkey thing um, that just works. Notably, also the hosted version of Chroma will use the new and forthcoming distributed version of Chroma. Um, distributed Chroma will also be open source. Um, and that will enable serverless uh, semantics and then also serverless billing. And so, you know, if you create a vector index and then you don't ever use it over the course of the month, um, chances are it'll cost you zero dollars. And I think that's you know, the guarantee that developers want. It's also the guarantee that likely enterprises want. It's very expensive to keep all of this data in memory at all times. And there's no reason to be doing so for most applications. And so the ability to page hot and cold and manage spend appropriately is also pretty important. You hear this complaint often that running these vector index workloads can be extremely expensive. Um, and bringing down the cost, I think, is a requirement to improving um, the scope of things and the scope of types of companies that can adopt this technology. Um, so, yeah, I mean, coming back to open source, uh, you know, we think that broadly the model here and the model as, you know, kind of uh, pioneered by folks like Mongo and Elastic, um, GitLab and others is that what you should do as a company is you should give away the engine and then monetize a car around it. And so the engine has to truly be open source. You know, you can't just uh, cut all the cylinders in half and call it an engine. No, the engine has to be a truly open source thing and ideally not BSL, right? Ideally Apache 2 or MIT or BSD 2 or 3 clause, a real open source project that becomes the ubiquitous standard for this technology. Um, and then there's a bunch of workflow stuff around it. You know, most developers in the end don't want to manage their own durability, don't want to manage their own backups, you know, want to sort of outsource that um, expertise to, you know, an organization that's specialized in doing so. Um, and so, yeah, I, we, we feel like the the, the synergy is, pretty, is, is really there. Um, you know, we don't feel like we're doing something that's antagonistic to developers by turning on a hosted service. We're only doing it because developers want us to. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, makes sense. You know, that's the model of uh, MongoDB Atlas or uh, Elastic and uh, even Redis. Uh, a lot of folks have done that earlier. So uh, you also got funded recently and, and now you're going with the hosted uh, uh, model of the Chroma database. So are you going to follow the approach of MongoDB Atlas where you co-locate the database in a specific zone, in a specific region of a hyperscaler, or uh, do you want to make that very transparent and have the hosted Chroma live on its own, uh, which is independent of any hyperscaler. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to build on top of the hyperscalers. Uh, I think there's, you know, <laughs> building our own data centers from the ground up is probably not advisable at this time. Um, no, what I mean so, is, uh, yeah. would you actually disclose that you are running on US East AWS and you know, GCP oh, yeah. US East? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we have no problem. I mean, it, it's important for developers to understand both the provider and the region when building applications, right? You want to be able to reason about the location of your data, even just for compliance reasons, right? There's certain cases where, you know, data cannot be exfiltrated from the EU to the US. And so understanding that, I think, is a requirement in building a system like this. Um, you know, in the short term, the first sort of hosted version of Chroma is a multi-tenant, large cluster that serves all developers on the serverless offering. Um, that will be on AWS. Um, in the future, um, we'd like to support dedicated clusters so that developers can say, I want GCP in this EU region, right? And it'll all configure it correctly for you, as well as um, hybrid deployments or bring your own cloud deployments where the control plane lives in Chroma's cloud account, but the data plane and all data at rest and in transit lives in the customer's cloud account. And this gives customers at that scale, obviously this is very much like an enterprise concern, but it gives those sorts of organizations the uh, privacy, security, security, and tenancy guarantees of data not leaving the VPC while still getting this like fully managed service and not having to staff you know large infrastructure teams to keep the system lively. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, 
uh, I'm actually seeing there are two approaches to storing the uh, vectors and embedding. So uh, one pattern is the co-location of the vector database, for example, PGSQL supporting PG vector, Elastic adding vector engine, and Cassandra ha adding, you know, for example, data stacks is bringing vector database capabilities to Cassandra. Uh, so co-locating embeddings along with this, this, the source of truth versus uh, a dedicated centralized vector database, which is becoming the single source of truth for a variety of data sources. So mm -hmm. uh, as, as someone you know who is building this from the ground up, which approach is better? And uh, where do you see dedicated vector databases coming into the picture? Yeah, I don't think there's a better or worse. I think it's very situational and kind of depends on what you're building. Um, so if you have all of your data that's relevant to your application already inside of Postgres, um, and, you know, you're building a semantic search application where you want to use embeddings and vectors to be able to do, you know, fuzzy matching, fuzzy search, to find lookalikes inside of that um, Postgres database. You know, you might, PG vector might be fine for your use case. Not exclusively, but maybe, maybe okay. Um, I think that if you're building an application for AI, um, you want to use the tools that are at the edge of what's possible, uh, not the tools that are lagging, you know, six months or a year behind. That's the first point. The second point is that most of the data that developers are bringing to AI is not currently in a database. Uh, most of it is unstructured data, not structured data. Um, so it's, you know, more uh, not data warehouse, but data lake, right? It's these like giant uh, pools of image data, video data, text data, PDFs, et cetera, et cetera. This data is not already in a database. And I think this is like why you're seeing such a readiness for developers to adopt a new tool. Um, you know, you look at the numbers and you see the growth of Chroma, but also the growth of some of the alternative projects. I think that growth is unexplainable without there being a shift in the types of data that are being onboarded for the very first time. And so, you know, generally speaking, I don't think that it makes sense to embed the column for first name, the column for last name, the column for street address, right? These relational fields, it's almost nonsensical to embed them. There's no value to embedding them. Um, it's things like a paragraph of text or an image um, where that semantic similarity becomes really powerful. And again, you know, for some users, it's fine, you know, use the tool that's best for you. I think that at Chroma, what we really care about is serving developers well. And if we want to serve developers well, we need to be sort of clear sighted about the kinds of cases where it makes sense to use one tool versus another. It's not always the case that a dedicated vector database like Chroma will be the right solution for you. Um, but we feel like for developers who want to push the needle on what's possible in AI, want to build production retrieval experiences, right? Not just a demo, not just something that you build in a weekend, but actually a system that you put into production and you trust, um, you want to be using a tool that's purpose-built to help you do that. And that's really our goal. Uh, I think we're still very early in that, in that life cycle. You know, if you think about this as a horse race, right? Uh, the horses have really just left the stables. Maybe they're halfway down the track or not even there, maybe 10% of the way down the track. And so I think we're still, uh, obviously I'm, I'm biased here, but we're still waiting to see which ones really break out, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the alternatives. Um, and our thesis remains that vector search is a very important tool on the toolbox, but is not a panacea to building production retrieval applications. And I could kind of rattle on a bunch of things um, about what's important, but give you one feature, which I think is incredibly important, we will build as a part of both probably open source and hosted Chroma, is just simply the idea of monitoring the recall of your graph. Mm -hmm. So once you move from no nearest neighbor to approximate nearest neighbor, there is just by necessarily math, uh, you drop quality, right? You drop your retrieval quality. But understanding that percentage at any given time is really important. And we've seen examples where people don't know that percentage and it's been as bad as 50% recall, which is just really bad. Like you don't want to have 50% recall in a production system. And so just having the tool of knowing at any given time what the percentage recall is of your, of your index. Um, again, I think that like we will absolutely do that for sure in the very near future. I think I'd be hard pressed to believe that a tool like PG Vector is going to add this sort of monitoring service attached to the offering. And so again, if you're a developer, if you want the right basket of tools to serve building an AI, I think Chroma will serve that very well. Um, you know, it's not right for everybody, but I think it's right for a lot of people. Very well said. The horses have just uh, uh, left the step. Perfect. <laughs> I love that analogy. So, uh, Jeff, the other thing is, the vector databases are only as powerful as the embeddings that are stored. So mm. are they at the mercy of the embedding models? For example, if you use an inferior embedding model that, that is not doing a good job of converting your uh, 
text or word into or sentences into embeddings the vector is only you know dependent on uh, on that so uh, how do you actually address this problem and uh, we are going to see like a plethora of embedding models that are going to be out there uh, how do you tackle this problem yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, any developer approaching the space or the category, building an application for the first time, has to answer a lot of questions, arguably too many questions. They have to answer questions about how do I chunk my data? Which embedding model do I select? Um, how do I iteratively improve the accuracy of the retrieval over the embedding space? Um, and then also things like other ways to address costs, either by um, dimensionality reducing the embedding space, so taking a large dimensionality and reducing it to a lower dimensionality, um, just by you know the, the number of uh, bytes that you store in memory, that can be a, a, a large reduction in cost, as well as quantization. So moving from like float 32 to like float 16 can again mean a very large percentage, in, a decrease in, in the cost of running such a system. All of these questions combined, um, I think are, uh, again, we're sort of very early in the life cycle here. Um, Chroma aims to give developers tools in the future to automate a lot of these questions. So questions like, how should I chunk up my data? Frankly, we don't think that a lot of the hand-tuned approaches today make a lot of sense. It reminds us of what hand-tuning looked like in the early days of computer vision and autonomy. Um, hand-tuned hyperparameters are, in general, very unstable and brittle and not something that uh, is sort of a, a, an early off-ramp that should be avoided. Um, and so we have ways that we can bring, you know, modern approaches to AI to solve things like chunking. On the embedding model piece specifically, you know, this is also the, re the renaissance of why this technology is so powerful now is because of language models, how they're trained, right? Embeddings are a sort of key output of such a system. And so the power and expressiveness of a language model can be sort of embodied in the embedding as well. And so this is why the timing of these technologies have become so relevant and powerful. Um, However, as you said, it's not always going to be the perfect embedding model for your data. Ultimately, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And so how can you make your model more useful over time? And we think that tools like fine tuning are incredibly important. It's sort of this really interesting thing. You know, think about a classic database. The exhaust of how your database is being used doesn't really improve the quality of your database. I mean, maybe it does because you, a developer, go into Datadog and you look at what queries are slow and then you manually update your database to add new indexes, right? This sort of thing. What's really right. interesting about uh, vector search and vector databases is, and embedding spaces, is given the way that your users are using it um, and given like both uh, thumbs up and thumbs down, right? This is a good retrieval, this is a bad retrieval. That kind of information can be used to fine tune the embedding space and make it fit better the documents that you have inside and the queries that are accesses, accessing it. Um, and so again, this is a, the kind of future that we think that all developers will use in the future um, and should be a, a first party supported thing um, with you know really easy developer experience and semantics. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully eventually, you know, we can kind of get away entirely from developers having to select which embedding model they're gonna use. And the right. system can just say, hey, here's your query, here's your data. This is the best answer and go. Right. But, but Jeff, there is you know, one more thing. But before I get there, you know, uh, there are too many knobs and uh, dials that the developer will have to deal with uh, to get the right retrieval system in place. It all starts with the right amount of chunks. It all starts with you know, using the right uh, effective embedding model. And then yep. the top K uh, parameter, uh, uh, which will impact you know, the results that you feed to the LLM. So yeah. all these are almost like hyperparameter tuning. There is no single answer. You have to go for trial and error to figure out what really makes sense. But one very pertinent problem that I'm actually seeing in this space is when uh, a query is run on a vector database and it comes back with uh, the response, mm. uh, it, is, it is fragmented. For example, if I have the K as 10, the most relevant answer uh, or the or the chunk uh, could be at the tenth, uh, while the first three are only slightly relevant. Now, obviously, I'm going to miss out because my context length of the LLM doesn't support so much of uh, data. So I'm right. going to pick up the top three uh, from the from the query results, and I'm going to feed that. And obviously, I'll miss out on the most relevant information sitting at the bottom of the heap. So. Uh, I actually read in one of the research papers that the only way to address this is to have a recommender or uh, a ranker, you know, that sure. will further sort 
the output from the vector database query and uh, adjust this rank so that you know the, the right relevant context is fed to the LLM. So my question is, will Chroma ever have uh, an embedded uh, ranker model, which is going to take the output and then sort it by the relevance? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of steps that you can do both before you run a query as well as after you run a query. So we call this uh, like pre pre query pipelines and post query pipelines um, that can potentially augment the resulting uh, retrieval or relevancy right of your query. And so re ranking is a great example. Um, you know, I think it's not entirely the ship hasn't entirely sailed on whether re ranking can be used to fine tune the embedding space itself and then skip the re ranker altogether. I think that's an open question. Um, I think the state of the of the of the market today is very much like any early stage market, and so there's you know about 300 different theories floating around for how to improve the uh, relevancy of the system of these systems, the, the performance of these systems. Um, you know, most of them work at least in one or two situations, right? Uh, there wouldn't be a theory if they didn't exist. If they didn't work at least one time. Um, but it's not obvious that any of these should be best practices yet. That they've worked in almost all cases, um, or that they or that their cost or latency are uh, acceptable to be added. This is actually one of the things where you see a lot of applications now, a lot of these like funnels, not a lot, but you, start, you, see, you see some of it on Twitter at least, right? These funnels where they heavily use language models to both pre and post process the query for around the vector database. Really interesting stuff. You see some pretty interesting results, uh, but you think about the both cost and both in terms of time um, and real money to doing so. And uh, you know, it kind of, it, it, makes, you, it makes you shudder inside, right? Um, and it, it feels it feels wrong. Now, of course, language models are going to get much cheaper and much faster to run. And so I think that if you think about what's five or 10 years in the future, uh, it's much more palatable. Um, so to give you a long story short, we think re-ranking is really relevant. We think re-ranking will likely be a, a kind of inside of the product surface area of Chroma. Um, mm. You know, they can give those tools to developers because, again, they are, that's probably one of the tools that is more, um, you know, bulletproof. We think that will likely stand the test of time. Um, but I think it is still quite early and, you know, ultimately kind of our product philosophy is that we don't necessarily care about being the first to offer any given feature, but we do care about being the last to offer any given feature. And, you know, what I mean by that is, uh, not last in terms of, you know, last place, but last in terms of, you know, we want to kind of write the manual or like write the textbook on how the thing should be done and make the API as clean and easy and powerful uh, and expressive to use for the end developer as well. And so um, we're watching stuff really closely. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be really fascinated to see how it all evolves too. Very interesting. Yes, these are very early days. And RAG is no more a simple pipeline of, you know, source and embedding and store, retrieve and feed to the LLM. It is becoming increasingly complex. As I said, there is pre-query processing, post-query processing. And I've also seen some of my customers thinking of using an LLM uh, sitting in between the large production grade LLM and the vector database just to make sure, you know, it summarizes and condenses the output and feeds that to the actual LLM. So it's going yep. to be a pretty complex orchestration that uh, we're going to see. Uh, so talking about orchestration, what do you think of Langchain versus Llama Index? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't see them as a versus necessarily. I think they kind of, you know, serve different audiences, serve different needs, largely speaking. I think they, you know, sometimes you can think about them in the same bucket, which is it's a way to express your business logic um, into, you know, the terms of, uh, of language models. So how to get data out, how to embed things. They have different sort of retrieval schemes, you know, different like hierarchical embeddings or this or that. You know, Chroma supports a first party integration for Langchain and Llama Index and the great relationship with both of those teams, um, do a lot of co-marketing with them, do a lot of events with them. Um, I think that, you know, the, the big question for Langchain and Llama Index, I say going forward, is sort of, again, this question about, um, you know, to what degree do you give developers a, a you know, you imagine opening up a, a toolbox, right? Um, and there's uh, literally a million tools inside, right? At the extreme case, um, you know, that toolbox may not be so useful because identifying which tool is the correct, you know, right tool to use becomes very overwhelming um, versus if you open up a toolbox and there's only two tools, um, again, not you can use a hammer to do most things, I guess, but it's still kind of a blunt force instrument to do most things. Um, and so I think like finding, striking that balance between uh, convention and configuration ultimately becomes the challenge of any sort of, you know, type of a framework 
that sits at that level of expressing business logic. You, know, you look and look back to the history of you know Django, Ruby on Rails, Next.js, Laravel and PHP days, right? <laughs> um, you know, again, that 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 line of kind of configuration convention. How do you get developers enough expressive power to be able to break out of any given box that they need to to be able to build and ladder their ladder the abstraction hierarchy of complexity to build exactly what they need while still giving them like a easy onboarding experience and all these other things. So I think that's the challenge for both of them. Um, I think that they're both up to the task, you know, knowing their teams. Um, they're both, you know, really smart teams. Um, and yeah, I mean, we love working with both. Awesome. So uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm tracking Chroma closely and you have done a lot of right things, uh, you know, like uh, including an embedding model right inside the database. Uh, it may not be the most efficient, but it does serve the purpose for a lot of projects. And Apache Parquet, um, uh, storing the files locally in that Apache Parquet format is a very, very uh, effective and efficient way. Uh, and JavaScript SDK for Chroma has been other very useful uh, mechanism. So uh, you have done uh, a great job in shaping up the product, and I'm looking forward to seeing the distributed Chroma and running that on Kubernetes. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The distributed Chroma really is like the next sort of generation for us. Um, again, we built it because we needed we needed it. We needed to offer hosted Chroma, and I think we were not insane enough to operationalize a single node database. Um, and we, you know, we knew that cost was a big part of the story that developers cared about, and that serverless functionality would be so important. And so, a fully distributed, cloud-native, multi-tenant, serverless database, you know, is more than just a bunch of buzzwords. Um, I think that each of those things is actually extremely important for us in building a service, but will also be really great for a lot of our customers that either are, you know, data teams inside of large companies that want to build a service internally for all of their different engineering teams to use. Um, you know, again, uh, multi-tenant and serverless are quite important. And, uh, you know, we, we also built it um, because we had to. Um, you know, we're not, uh, we don't have too much of not invented here syndrome. And, uh, you know, we sort of looked at what was out there and, you know, what things could we possibly use to help us do this and came to the conclusion that we had to build it from scratch. And so um, I think it's, it's a challenging thing to build a new distributed product. However, there's also, you know, maybe 2023 is the year to do it. Um, you, know, you just look right. at the advancements in companies um, using object storage for durability, companies using um, right ahead logs at the ingestion point, companies, you know, uh, sort of having novel schemes, but proven schemes for distributing traffic across many nodes for write, the write and read path. Um, you know, those patterns now are really starting to bake. Um, and we can really, um, we don't have to necessarily pioneer a lot of those patterns, but we can pick up the best practices um, and implement them. So I will, I will maybe I'll, I'll, I'll avoid go opining too long about some of this nerd <laughs> stuff, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. And uh... Uh, wishing the team Chroma all the best and I'm closely tracking your progress and success. All the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great to chat. Same here. Thank you.